found out. I think everybody knows. From the from the cognitive and psychology department. Cognitive sciences. So we're talking in English, okay? Um, and we're going to learn about psychophysics and also how I guess it. Um, thank you. Okay, we can get this up here. Um, no, it's I'm going to finish math. Apparently, that's not a possibility. No? necessary to make him the loyal enough machine to us. No, in the end, I should I made some crucial fashion choices this morning that did not take this into account. The video is the poor. So, I don't know what this is doing. Mother? Good? Okay. Okay. So I thought I'd introduce myself a little bit. Maybe we could. Uh, oh, okay. uh, I'll introduce a little bit of. Uh, so this is actually my lab before the furniture arrived. Uh, so I don't know if you recognize some of the faces you might see around in various uh, Jerusalem Brain community events. Um, and um, and before we start talking about the psychophysics, which is the purpose of uh, my lecture today, um, I thought I'll just kind of tell you in a word, like what is the type of work that we do in my brain attention and time lab. Um, so generally speaking, I'm, uh, I come uh, kind of from a cognitive psychology background. Uh, so I, I did my training uh, here at the Hebrew University. Then I did my PhD at, in uh, UC Berkeley, where I was doing squarely what I think would be considered good informed cognitive neuroscience that is informed by cognitive psychology. Um, uh, specifically, um, attention was a focus quite uh, from the get-go. Um, and um, in past years, since uh, my postdoc training in Germany, I've uh, started looking at the time courses of attention, and I might kind of use some of my data to exemplify some of the points uh, uh, later. Um, but one of the things that I developed in, uh, in my, um, in along, the, along the years is a way basically to measure uh, time courses of performance in quite a precise and uh, detailed manner. And we could discuss this kind of embedded in the, in the lecture later. Um, in addition to attention, I'm also interested in the passage of time, subjective sense of time. How do we actually um, know that a certain temporal interval have, has passed? Why does time sometimes pass faster and sometimes never uh, pass at all? Um, and both my attention and time uh, research is quite heavily embedded in a framework of brain rhythms. So these are brain responses you don't learn much about in, uh, I think, your program, but you could come over to, uh, to Mount Scopus. Some of you have probably got some of that in your undergraduate uh, um, training through classes with me. Um, but if you uh, measure... Yeah, I'm sure that's okay, that's good. So you have some... some so I have yeah, a whole... Some, some very basic level. Yeah. So there's a full seminar on brain rhythms, which, uh, which is offered every other year. Um, but those are uh, neural responses that are uh, said to be associated with dendritic inputs as measured with using methods of EEG in different scales. So I'm sure that you'll discuss uh, various scales from non-invasively all the way to invasively uh, measuring local field potentials. And so I try to link behavior and uh, specifically attention, and the time course of attention, fluctuations in attention, uh, as well as time perception um, with models that are basically Im implementing these capacities uh, with brain rhythm. Um, and finally, uh, another important feature where I think psychophysics really helps me out a lot 
is the fact that the type of models that I work for brain rhythms are actually a ubiquitous phenomena. You see them in many different m modalities of the brain and systems. Um, and so the models that we construe in the lab are models that uh, have the promise of being implemented in many different systems. And that's kind of where you really need to get control over your stimuli and your behavioral testing. So we have uh, currently in the lab um, uh, work looking at the tactile modality, at the auditory modality, in addition to my heavy kind of intense vision background. And, um, and we are also looking at uh, um, interactions with um, various motor actions uh, that could also affect how we perceive um, uh, how we uh, perceive stimuli in general and how we uh, perceive the passage of time. So blinks is another interesting ecological illusion that helps us uh, kind of uh, keep track of these things. So this is uh, what we do, but I'm here to talk about psychophysics and um, I thought I would just kind of uh, put up there the number, a number of uh, quirky looking luminaries uh, uh, that really kind of started, uh, started the field. Uh, so these are uh, Wunsch, Fechner, Helmholtz, and, and Weber, all names that you might have encountered in, uh, in, your, um, in your training if you come from psychology departments or if you come from good psychology departments where good perceptual uh, classes are offered. Uh, we're not going to talk about the history. I think there's a lot of interesting work that has been done, and we're talking back to the 19th century at the birth of the field of experimental psychology. Um, uh, we will really talk about the powers uh, of these methods and their utility in the context of doing cognitive neuroscience. Um, and before I jump right into uh, looking at the various aspects of psychophysics that I would like to highlight to you, I'd like to actually assess within the group uh, a few questions so that I kind of can infer how this may or may not be relevant to you. So, uh, so this is you guys, just kidding. <laughs> this, this is a, a group of uh, unsuspecting students, and well, I, I was kind of curious to, to, sh to have a show of hands of how many people are already working in experimental setups. So how, are, how many people are engaged in research already? Okay, and um, how many of you are already designing your experiments? Okay, and then uh, how many actually uh, are already psychophysics fans? Okay, so we have one over there. <laughs> Neil has no choice, <laughs> he has to be, and uh, sure, yeah, good. Um, okay, so, um, so really psychophysics often in the field is just referred to any type of measurement that comes from behavior. I'm a little bit of a snob in that sense, and I kind of refer the use of psychophysics to, uh, to a very particular type of behavioral assessment, but we will go over uh, at least three classes of, of behavioral assessment um, in a second, and, and those would be reaction times, accuracy, and then, as I said, a more kind of narrow definition that I provide to psychophysics, uh, which would be the, the case in which we're trying to link between physical parametric variations and stimuli and uh, a, a, a function that is our perception. So that's kind of what I will be, uh, will be calling psychophysics. And really what I'm doing uh, over the course of the next uh, um, two-hour class is I'm going to basically highlight things that I think are practical considerations that I think are useful. Uh, so we will start by touching briefly upon uh, the measurement of reaction time and accuracy. And here, uh, I think at least for Noah and um, Leol, this might be a little bit of a repetition given that they have taken classes with me and these are things I feel very strongly about. So I really train students from the undergraduate <laughs> level um, to, um, to kind of internalize these aspects. But, uh, but one important uh, I I kind of handle I would like all of you, or sensitivity I would like all of you to have is the fact that, um, that a reaction time uh, and accuracy are not just two measures you can obtain from behavior. So maybe in some experiments you really can look at both features and you could look at relationships between them. However, if you're designing your experiments and what you're trying to show is some kind of modulation in performance, um, a reaction time experiment would warrant a different type of experiment compared to an accuracy experiment. And it's actually quite trivial. Basically, if you have, for example, a simple discrimination such as that of Bush and Obama, uh, and you're having people, and whatever you're researching, you're basically presenting these pictures and having people provide responses, which is that classification, um, then, um, then you can look at reaction time. This is an easy task you expect in a good reaction time experiment. You would like your, t your, your participants to basically be performing above 90%. And this, of course, also pertains to animal research, right? So all the things we're talking about, and this is kind of a cool era we're in where 
Uh, I think the, the biggest advances in cognitive neuroscience over the last 10 years are the fact that animal research is really starting to adopt a very intense behavioral approach to um, measuring performance. And so the principles are the same. Uh, while if you're really wanting to look at the modulation that is expressed in your accuracy uh, levels, then, well, then you really need to have a dynamic range, right? So if you have these two tasks, of course, you might have a couple more errors here versus here for whatever reason, but making serious inferences from that would be quite meaningless. While if you, for example, morph the two, and this maybe is still quite easy, but you get the idea, you could morph, for example, two faces or make, two, make a discrimination task more difficult, um, and, and that would be kind of a prerequisite for actually looking at accuracy, okay? So these are not the same experiments. I know that you kind of feel like you get one and the other for free, but these are really two different, uh, two different experiments. And that's basically all we're going to talk about in terms of reaction time and accuracy kind of in, uh, in, in a nutshell. So what is psychophysics? So psychophysics could be described uh, kind of superficially as a bunch of procedures with a common goal. And the common goal um, is basically uh, to link perceptual experience to a physical stimulus. So you have, on the one hand, parametric manipulation of physical features, and on the other hand, you will have the observer who's reporting their perception of the stimuli. And over the course of, uh, of the next two hours, I would like to, uh, to discuss three different ways in which psychophysics can help us in our research. And here I'm using now psychophysics in a more narrow sense. And so this is, if you will, um, an abbreviated outline of the, of the, um, of the talk today. Um, I think psychophysics could provide you with interesting uh, independent measures, right? You might be interested in, for example, um, uh, a certain threshold, uh, and we'll talk about what that means uh, in, um, in different conditions, or uh, you might be interested in how things appear and how their appearance changes due to contextual modulation, and then you would be using psychophysics as an end goal. So that would be the measure, a threshold, a slope of a function. We'll talk about what those mean, and I'll show you a few examples. Um, I think um, I, in my research, very often um, use uh, use psychophysics as a calibration tool, okay? And then that is basically a way for us to equate either uh, um, our stimuli over, uh, so if we have a few different types of stimuli, we might want to make sure that the, they, they are, except for what, so except for whatever reason we might have or design two different stimuli, we might want them to be equal in other res respects. For example, we might want them to be equally difficult or equally visible. And so in that sense, you could uh, use them as, a, as a, a calibration tool. Another important type of calibration, in particularly in human research, though maybe also in animal uh, research, is that sometimes we will have a diverse group of subjects walk through the door for, our partici for, our, for participating in our experiments. And in, tho in those cases, we really would like to minimize the differences that is introduced by the fact that these are different individuals, right? As long as we're not studying individual differences, we're happy um, if we could have just cloned right, one subject 20 <coughs> times, that would have been useful, but we don't do science that way. We bring in a group, say 20 subjects in, and we want them uh, to, um, we want to minimize the noise between the different subjects, and thus we can uh, do a short calibration run in order to make sure that all our subjects are having kind of, uh, having to expand a similar effort uh, or have a task that is of similar difficulty, albeit there differences in uh, predispositions. And then, finally, and I'm not sure we'll have a lot of time to talk about this, but, um, but if you are interested in how the brain is mediating perception or how it's mediating any cognitive function, and you are able to take the cognitive functions that you're interested in and break them down to some kind of parametric dimension, then you could, uh, you could describe the function of this uh, parametric dimension in perception and then search through, for example, some physiological space for where in the brain you can actually, um, uh, you can see that model being fulfilled. So that would be kind of, uh, um, I wouldn't call it computational approach, but I would, uh, would kind of uh, think this is a kind of a, an interesting way to take richness in behavioral models and in cognitive functions that we can model behaviorally on the one hand and then look at uh, at the brain, which is of course a very diverse organ that might uh, implement 
um, different models in different brain regions and so on and so forth. So then you can, you, by, by having a really good description of the behavior or the cognitive function that you're measuring, then you, uh, you can kind of go with that to the brain and then qualify or, uh, or fit or do some, uh, some sort of uh, search uh, approach uh, for that model in brain activity, something that will ultimately uh, you know, it, you could think of it as, a, as something to help you reduce the dimensionality of your data on the one hand, um, or, um, or something to guide your hypotheses if you're not in a very theoretically rich context of an inquiry, okay? So, so starting uh, with, uh, with uh, investigating or using uh, psychophysics as a dependence measure, and this is really our chance to talk about the basic concepts, right? So I said the word function, and I said uh, uh, the word parametric variations of your stimuli, and of course, um, um, all these uh, concepts need to be uh, defined and described. So, so this could be kind of uh, uh, a, uh, a classic uh, kind of layout of psychophysical data. And here I chose this kind of cute example where we have, um, on the one side, uh, a full picture of. Uh, President Bush and on the other uh, side, President Obama, and we could basically show multiple, or we do in tech physics, we show multiple repetitions, for example, of five different levels of, uh, of these uh, parametrically varied stimuli, and the, par the way this is parametrically varied is the percentage of how much Bush and how much Obama I have, so here I have 50% Bush and 50% Obama, and here I have 25 Obama, 75 Bush, and vice versa here. And I could ask uh, uh, my subjects to basically provide, uh, provide a response, which is, uh, is this Bush or Obama? So the same task that we were uh, kind of looking at uh, previously. And, um, and then uh, the, the general kind of parametric type behavior that we could get would look something like this, right? So now I have five different levels of performance for my five different levels of uh, of my stimulus, and in psychophysics, often we will call this stimulus intensity, right? So the kind of the paradigm would be a contrast or, or something like that. This is actually kind of a unique stimulus for the world of psychophysics. Yeah. So in this case, the task could be: uh, please press button one if this is Bush, and button two if this is Obama. So we'll get this picture, and we would make sure that we have multiple repetitions in each of these uh, um, parametric levels or stimulus intensities conventionally uh, regarded. And then we could, uh, you know, when you are seeing Bush, it's very unlikely that you will say that this is Obama. And so we're plotting now the percent uh, response Obama. So you expect, and basically what you want of any, so psychophysics works in our hands when we have our parametric variation here taking us from zero to 100. Then, then we feel that we captured a dynamic range in performance uh, and that we're in the relevant range of stimulus intensities, yeah. I see a lot in this uh, class before, but uh, I don't know how, how, how people generate it and uh, how, how, how it can quantify so the percentage. So, so how do I calculate this? No, no, I mean, uh, the, the graph. How, how you generate this graph and uh, how you quantify it? It's 50 Obama and 50 Bush. So how does the morphing work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this case, I mean, so obviously I could have given myself an easier life and just put like percent contrast or something like that here. But morphing, face morphing, there's a lot of software that that allow you to do face morphs and the way face morphing works in two seconds would be. Right. So this wouldn't be a very controlled stimulus, right? So this could be uh, right. This is obviously just a schematic. So. Uh, so don't get attached to this data, and these are not real performance levels but either. I have a question about that. So if, if you do something which is non-linear or something, some kind of like modification, which is your x axis, mm -hmm. do you expect it that it will? So is it will map in some lean, I don't know, what way to the y axis to the performance. You, you see what I'm asking? The contrast you can actually change, and it's like some physical something that is is maybe easy to control, but if it's like become more if my dimension is not a linear dimension or it's not kind of simply parametric, then I, then, then I, would, have to, I would have to think up what the right function would be, right? So that is kind of when we choose a function. Right now, I didn't choose a function yet, um, but, but I'm, I'm purposely taking a very simple case where we do have a simple parametric space. Um, and it turns out, it's, at least when you look at perceptual uh, systems, 
quite often you do have a parametric space that is modeled reasonably well with this kind of shape of a function. Um, do you have an example of something that wouldn't be? Uh, I just wonder if you should be worried about what the reason is or whatever. So stimulus choice is extremely important. Is ex the way you then do the analysis afterwards is the, the consideration? Or so I would say that the, the basic psychophysics that you use, like I would not recommend you to use, for example, uh, threshold or psychophysical measures as your dependent measure if you don't know enough about your parametric uh, dimension. And actually, I guess in, in my lab, we have kind of an interesting moment now because we're embarking into tactile perception. And so, and this is something we always, like when vision scientists go to other modalities, they feel super kind of cool and, and in command because we know so much about vision. So we could just go and do like what we do in vision and another modality. And often we're very much humbled by the fact that, that we need to really be very careful about how uh, like simple things that we would think our general kind of principles and perception don't necessarily work that way. So, so sure, pilot your stimuli, figure out you know if you have that kind of behavior in general. And when you're using psychophysics as a dependent measure, typically you will have an hypothesis about uh, about a certain modulation that you're looking for. So, uh, and I'll show you one example of that um, in a second. So I have five levels of performance here, um, coded as percent response Obama. And, um, and the next thing that, uh, that is um, um, useful to do in this case is to fit a function. And here um, I will say that quite often or more often than not, the, the actual function uh, doesn't make a dramatic effect. Or I would wish for all of you to do psychophysics where the function you pick is not what makes the difference. So logistic functions, sigmoid functions, uh, viable functions, these are all the type of functions that are often used, but the general, uh, the general um, benefit or use of doing this function fitting procedure is instead of having a, a five points kind of resolution of this parametric space, the function, um, assuming that it doesn't have a big error and assuming that the fit is good, and these are things we, as we assess when we do these function fits, um, is, uh, is allowing you basically to interpolate the data. So if I'm uh, interested, uh, or if I, you know, we all should be so lucky that, for example, a certain experimental manipulation will take us from one level of a stimulus in terms of performance and shift all the way to the next level, but that might not always be the case, right? So, so modulations might be finer than the graininess of our parametric variation, um, and, uh, and having the function fit can really allow us to, to, to interpolate the data and now have all the in-between uh, variables or at least have a way to estimate the performance levels of regions that we haven't sampled in terms of our stimulus parameters. And why wouldn't we use uh, many more stimulus parameters? It's a, it's it's a simple practicality, right? We, we have limited time. We can't show all possible stimulus uh, uh, levels. And there's some wisdom to how many, uh, how many levels would be enough. And we sometimes do things like densely populate uh, with, uh, with in-between levels, for example. So we might have only 10 trials uh, on, on the extremes because we kind of trust that we're in the right range, but we'll then more densely populate uh, with trials in, in a dynamic range. But still, ultimately, we won't, we won't have time to to look at all possible stimulus levels. Um, and then specifically, uh, we are often interested in a certain measure of a threshold. So what is the point at which we are kind of uh, maximally confused by the stimulus? And in this case, I'm kind of plotting a, a case where, um, where that would be, uh, for example, this stimulus. So here it kind of corresponds, but it doesn't have to be that way. And by having performance and the function fit, we could basically say, uh, you know, 100% uh, to 0% is a continuum, or 0% to 100% is a continuum. It's possible that it's actually at 42% uh, Bush and 58% and, uh, 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 Obama that we are at this point of confusion or the threshold of, uh, of, of saying which, uh, which stimulus it is that we're seeing. We would call that a, a threshold or a point of subjective equality. Yeah. Like, is there a way of quantifying if an image is actually more Bush? Like, what percentage is 
So you still have queries with uh, with my my toy example. So why don't I show you how we could? So 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 um, I didn't uh, stall on the. I had a big tree to show you that there are many different tasks. But in psychophysics, there generally we talk about appearance tasks versus performance tasks. And this would be um, so. I mean, if I'm really interested in the quantification and um, or if I would even want to say, forget about how much percentage I put there, I want to kind of define how much, uh, how much Bush and how much Obama I have in each picture based on uh, people's performance, we would be focusing on, on basically a performance type of task where there is a right answer. But, um, but actually this example comes from a case where I could very easily show you how uh, I could make, for example, this stimulus look one way versus another. And that takes us into the realm of appearance tasks. So it's a little bit like um, um, a pants or, you know, and a, uh, so uh, kind of when I say threshold estimates or performance uh, estimates, then I want you to think about, um, uh, you know, the type of experiment where I'm showing um, a standard fixed Muller liar uh, illusion. So when you're doing appearance uh, tests, you're generally in the realm of illusions, which is a wonderful place to be, particularly if you're interested in perception. So you could have like a, a task that we would call a two-interval uh, uh, force choice. You will see this stimulus, and then you will see uh, a stimulus that looks like this, right? And of course, the basic illusion is that this looks longer than this, even though they're completely equal. But I could show you uh, a lot of difference. So my parametric uh, space now is going to be the length of the comparison stimulus, and I could, you know, go and search for the case in which, you know, what length do I need to show you so that it looks equal to this one, okay? So there, I guess maybe that would be an easier, uh, a more palpable uh, example for you to, to kind of come along with me. But thankfully, there is a reason why I'm using this example, because I can actually show quite dramatic shifts in how you perceive this dimension. And it's just too cute to, to skip. So, uh, and I think that's what's coming up. So, so this is actually the, the picture that, uh, that was placed right there in the 50% uh, level of performance. So this is, you know, according to whatever morphing stimulus, uh, morphing software we use, the 50% middle. And, um, and what I want you to all engage in right now is what uh, could be considered a simple adaptation experiment. So I want you to all stare at uh, Bush, remember maybe uh, things that are, uh, so, sorry, Obama. See, they're all the same to me right now, <laughs> and it's all, you know, very faint history. But um, but just fixate maybe on the no. Try to kind of minimally min minimally uh, move your eyes and just really kind of allow this stimulus to uh, to really be fully processed. Uh, and I'm going to give you a few seconds, and I'm going to take uh, extra time and you know make you remember where you were in 2008 when he was elected, and then again where you were in 2012 when he was re-elected, and then you know what happened in 2016, and um, and just stay with the stimulus as long as possible, and um, and I guess now is a good safe moment to go to this stimulus. Now this stimulus, previously I'm not sure how it looked to you, but right now it should be looking very much like Bush, okay? And, uh, and you know, this still might not be very believable, uh, but, uh, but the point of, of this type of modulation or this type of method is that we're using these stimuli that have an uncontrolled background and all these things that are terribly contaminating, is that regardless of all this contamination, if I were to give you this experiment now, after this long ex exposure, we would see a modulation in the function, such that now the place where you would be maximally confused, depending on what the adapter was, or uh, depending on what it were, um, would shift. Okay? And this is kind of an example of how we use, um, how we use uh, the, um, the threshold, or in this case we would call it the point of subjective equality, because this is not a, a performance task, or it's not a, it's it's a it's a um, it's an appearance task. Now, uh, uh, your the, the the appearance of these stimuli has changed as due to your previous ex experience. Now, you as critical audience still might be like, sure, she showed us these stimuli. This still doesn't help us really feel the shift in my perception because she only showed us half of the 
the example. And now the next part is really has no didactical purpose except for making all this a little bit more believable. So now I'm going to be uh, having you go down memory lane even further and think of eight years of President uh, W. Bush. Uh, place your gaze right around his nose and spend some time with that. I don't know, you were probably like, what, in kindergarten then or something like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, you might not know this guy very well, <laughs> but he was the president for eight years. Um, and stare at him as much possible. Allow yourself to have the full visual experience. And following the stimulus, I will go back to that 50%, okay? So I'm going to be showing you a stimulus that you've seen by now at least three times. Um, at first, we didn't discuss much what it looked like to you. The second time around, I made it look a lot like Bush for you. And, um, and uh, now the third time, I'm going to uh, assess, okay, what does it look like now? Okay, so with all this background business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, once again, if I were to go back to that psychometric curve, I would be able to quantify a change in this stimulus's appearance and the, stim and, and the change, of course, will be associated with, um, with adaptation processes, which are uh, quite high level, right? Uh, you know, uh, Aviv was disturbed by the color in the background and you guys were disturbed by this particular algorithm that I might have used to, to, to create these morphs. Of course, I did not create these morphs, but uh, regardless, whoever created them. Uh, and the point of, of this is adaptation processes really can occur at many different levels of, uh, of the hierarchy. And, uh, and it turns out that I'll bite all these low-level differences. Oh. It doesn't go away. <laughs> I guess it's better, right? Very Depends. I mean, yeah, it is a very strong effect, and it has been an interesting case for uh, the study of faces and the dimensions governing face processing. Yeah. Is there a way to change it, not with another bush or Make it go away? You want to <laughs> start with what change it how? Here, how's Obama. this? Better? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sorry. No, I, I just You're still seeing Obama. Yeah. So it is a so so you could by now as uh, as uh, uh, you know 20 minutes uh, face researchers you uh, are able to see that it's not affected by low level changes of the background and that it is an effect that is quite long lasting um, and so on and so forth. I would say you know that you could probably intuitively say other things about this hybrid uh, stimulus like we didn't actually discuss it before we started this manipulation like what does it actually look like and and i think maybe that's where the question came like wait how can you tell me that this is 50% and of course um you know i i i didn't really run that experiment does does this really like to the naive participant uh render a 50% bush obama classification probably not and actually, now we, nowadays we know that serial dependency effects are actually quite long-lasting, several seconds. Um, so, so, so this is the world we're in right now. Right? When we walk around uh, the world uh, and we stare at things, they are going to affect how we look at uh, other things. And I actually have an anecdote from when my, uh, when my uh, first uh, baby girl was born. Uh, so obviously, I mean, I, I was recovering from birth and I had a little newborn, which was just this, like a completely mind-blowing thing like there. So I obviously, as a good scientist, I was observing quite a lot. So I spent maybe a few days just observing, and this is California, before, uh, before venturing out into the world. And then I was walking in the street and everybody looked extremely ugly to me. And I can't attribute this to anything else other than just I've been completely adapted to this like perfect you know, baby, uh, baby proportions of a face, and you could show this. I could have bring, I mean, we could have done a whole class of staring and giggling at uh, face adaptation examples, but of course, like, the proportions is a, dim a relevant dimension for faces, and there's no question that now I was looking at people and their noses seemed big and their, their foreheads seemed small, and it's like, it was quite a compelling effect. It didn't measure how long it lasted. But this is perception. Perception is, uh, you know, you could construe perception as a bunch of, Results of adaptation encountering external world. And why, I mean, maybe it's a very side question, but it makes no sense. Why, what's the function of this? For okay. us or so, for oh, I'm sure, like in this campus and in the other campus, I think there are a lot of people that are investigating adaptation. Adaptation can have very uh, opposite effects in different systems. Um, you know, Eli Nelkin, your, your chair, the chair of your, your, uh, your graduate program and, and, and entire department has dedicated a nice portion of his career to looking at, at some corner of those effects and 
people do this research also in other systems. So I think adaptation is a fascinating uh, topic. It has been, it's been used methodologically as well. So if have, has someone talked to them about fMRI adaptation and release from uh, fMRI suppression, repetition suppression? So that's a shame. So I think it's really, a, it's a really interesting. So you should come and take an undergraduate uh, course. Uh, no, just kidding. An undergraduate uh, class. So, so, uh, so I find that adaptation seems to be a very hot topic because I teach it to the undergrads. I don't think I taught it to you guys. I don't think I, oh no, we did. We did talk about it. So my students know about fMRI adaptation. It's, it, it is a phenomenon that occurs in many different levels and it is fascinating because it makes a lot of con uh, contradictory, um, contradictory uh, predictions, right? It could make you better, but maybe it could make you fatigued at certain d dimensions. So, um, I'm not sure, but like, how can you discriminate adaptation from just making it like a comparison test? Because now you can evidently like you look at something and then you immediately see the differences. Right. So, uh, so I will ask your question in a slightly different way. Uh, you could ask how. Um, uh, so kind of where in the hierarchy is this happening? Is this a low-level effect? Like, does this have to do with the fact that both spaces were overlapping in space, right? So you could ask, you know, is the dimension something very physical that is attached to where the adapter was? And then you're really doing these kind of difference comparisons, or is this a more abstract, uh, uh, this kind of more abstract representation that would then transfer to other places? Um, and and I think that your description as comparing differences could pertain to both types of effects and could be a possible description of what adaptation is. I mean, as it happens, people often think of at least, uh, you know, there, there are a few divergent ma models for adaptation, but the kind of common sense is you have a population kind of responding to something in different proportions. So some, uh, and, 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 and uh, the population that is most selective to a certain stimulus is going to undergo some kind of habituation or some kind of decrease in its response. And then, encountered with yet a new stimulus, they are starting from a worse standpoint. And that could be uh, an implementation of you saying, how do I know that I'm not just comparing differences? So I don't know if this is an overly convoluted answer. But, uh, yeah? No, I think of it like I think maybe in the higher level, there's something opposite to adaptation, or like that's the way advertisements work. Because you get exposed to something more and more, and it's not like you get adapted. Right, so that's why I was saying there's like different type of predictions we could make. We could make, you know, a prediction where the fact that we're adapting to something would make us more proponent and ready for it, or this kind of description that I just made, which is maybe a little bit over schematized, but where if you are kind of fatigued from something, then you become less sensitive to that. And in the literature, looking from the individual neuronal measurement to population to intracellular to uh, uh, multiple population to non-invasive physiology to bold responses that are indirect measures of, uh, of physiology, there are, you, you could find a very uh, wide uh, range of uh, effects of adaptation. So. I think face adaptation generally does transfer location. Yeah. So at least face adaptation does. But that's always a question you asked about the adaptation. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so that was an appearance test, and I used these terrible stimuli that I had no way to show are valid in order to bring about this uh, this kind of quite dramatic modulation in your uh, in the appearance of this stimulus that was kept constant over three different presentation conditions. An example uh, that I like to bring, uh, and they're like, I really could do just like this to my desk and, 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 and pull out one, but I chose this one that comes from Rowan Cole and uh, um, from uh, Kia Novo's lab, uh, which is an example of what we would call a threshold uh, experiment or performance experiment. And so here, um, these researchers are interested in the impact of temporal context on um, on performance, and so what is happening here is that there is this patch of noise presented uh, in a sequence, so a different patch of noise every screen here. Um, the patches of noise could be um, in, in interspersed with, uh, with durations that are random within a certain range, or within a sequence which is uh, periodic, so it's regular. Every, every patch of noise is up for 400 milliseconds. And uh, this group is kind of interested in how, um, how the cognitive neural system is, um, 
adapting to this type of temporal structure. So this would be considered a temporally structured stimulus and this would be a less temporally structured stimulus. Um, and the, uh, the, the researchers are asking their subjects to make a, uh, a tilt orientation discrimination. So is a grating embedded inside this stream and marked very clearly with a pink circle around it, is that grating tilted to the right or to the left, okay? Um, and so, so they make sure that the local, uh, the local uh, properties are kept the same. So when the target occurs, the stimulus after it is always gonna be of the same length so that they can kind of uh, somewhat control for local temporal properties and they compare Basically, the threshold in being able to make that uh, um, the threshold of in being able to make that discrimination um, as a function of the kind of global temporal structure. Um, yeah. So, um, so I want to just highlight that uh, intensity levels here are actually the contrast of these um, of these gratings that are embedded. So they could have done two different, one of two tasks, right? They have an oriented grating, they could have varied how off-center or how off-vertical the, uh, the, the grating is and have the, then the threshold be the, uh, the minimal difference in orientation be the threshold. But in this case, what they're doing is the, the orientations are actually fixed at a certain level they're happy with. And what they're varying now is the contrast. How much, uh, how much are they, um, basically their visibility within this noise. And so this is the type of data that one uh, can get from this type of uh, manipulation here plotted for the group. Um, as often is in, uh, in our science where we have a lot of subjects, often the group plot is something we're very satisfied to see, but it actually often might not necessarily be the, the, the true measure of statistics, so we'll just take heed. So we really like to see this and it's really nice to see that uh, when things are regular, so their effect here is the threshold is, uh, is actually um, lower when there is regularity, when there is temporal structure, compared to when the, the stream is unstructured in time. Um, so it's nice to see this at the level of, um, of, the, um, of the group as it's plotted here. But importantly, and different from simple measures such as accuracy or reaction times, uh, in these type of data, we actually have a function for each individual subject. And from this function, we could glean from this very rich data, so a full function fit, right? Infinitely rich because we interpolate. Uh, we could actually uh, quantify each and every person's threshold and then do the statistics on that, right? So this fit uh, could have looked terrible, but the data would still be interesting, right? For example, take the case in which we would have one subject kind of in, in one side of the scale, another subject in another type of scale, uh, side of the scale, and, and, and that could water down any visible effect. Um, and so actually the more meaningful uh, plots here, I mean, it's, it is very satisfying to see the data. They are quite well behaved. Uh, but the more meaningful part here is the threshold uh, difference, which is basically if I had 20 subjects, I don't remember how much they have here, but if you take 20 subjects, for each subject they have a threshold for the regular and a threshold for the irregular, and then they're doing a within subjects uh, parametric uh, test or non-parametric, something I'm sure you're going to be learning about. Um, and they could basically look at the differences in the threshold, which kind of places it uh, in, a, in a purely kind of within subject uh, setup. Um, so the threshold is what we typically look for when we're using uh, psychophysics as an endpoint for, uh, for measuring performance threshold. Another interesting measure is the slope, right? So in this case, the slopes are quite equivalent and indeed they're not significantly different. But a slope, if you will, could, uh, could be an interesting proxy for what is the smallest difference that is noticed, right? So, uh, you know, how much of a change do I have in my function when I move along my, um, my, um, uh, my intensity level? Um, and often is also uh, related to the amount of noise you have in the data. So as I said, this would be a detection threshold, sometimes also called a performance threshold. And in uh, the old, uh, old guy's uh, words, Fechner, uh, who was one of the first to describe uh, these kind of measures. Uh, so absolute threshold is the minimal stimulus intensity that lifts its sensation over the threshold of consciousness. So that is kind of why we call these things a threshold. That's kind of the, at least the, the poetics behind it. 
Um, so uh, someone will have to tell me when it's time for the break. Is this now the time for the break? Yes. It is. So we'll take the break now.
עשרה מרווחים ולחזור אליהם, לעומת לדגום פרמטים של הגירוי בצורה רציפה. קיבלנו את זה שהם יכולים לחזור לעבודה בצורה רציפה, אבל הם יכולים לחזור לעבודה בצורה רציפה, תמיד יכול להיות בינינג, אבל אז אתה מורח את אבל אם יש לי נגיד אני בדקתי כל רמה פעם, יש לי או אפס או אחד. עדיין אני יכול לעשות פיט לזה שהוא עושים, נכון? נכון, אני חושבת שהיה לנו פעם איזושהי התקשות לעשות כך. אני חושבת שהיה לנו פעם איזושהי התקשות לעשות כך. כן, זה דעת המכוער. כן, זה דעת המכוער. וגם מבחינת ה-air, כאילו, אנחנו יכולים לעשות את זה בעצם מבחינת ה-air, בדינמיק מייט הגיע לך את זה בתחום הזה. כשאני מסתכל במרחב של תהרוג 
הבית של הסדר. ובשלב האימון הם מראים שתי חזרות מכל תמונה, ואז בשלב המחאה... אבל עדיין שתי חזרות של אותה תמונה, או שהם עושים את האדמות לתכולה ספקטרלית? כן, כל תמונה יש לה את הפיצ'ר. ואז עושים רגרסיה בין הפיצ'ר, נכון, אבל את תראית, אבל כל נקודה שאת רוצה לעשות, היא נקודה מאוד רועשת, כן, 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 תראה את התמונה בעוד פעם, וזה עובד, כאילו, והם אנשים חכמים, אז אני מניח שזה בסדר, כמו שאמרתי, אין עם זה בעיה, אבל אתה צריך... לדעת את הרזולוציית פורמנט שלך כשאתה ניגש להעריך חיים. זהו, הם בוחנים את הפורמנט על תמונות אחרות שהם מראים אותם שלושת הפעם כל תמונות. אז יש להם שם, יש להם משטר אחר של הרעש. כן, וגם הפסיכולוגיה, זאת אומרת, זה גם כאילו, במעשית שלהם הסופרניה, יש הפסיכולוגיה נכון, בסדר. words about stimulus choice, because I kind of, this is something I really uh, feel very strongly about, and I feel that a lot of the wisdom of behavioral sciences, so you, I mean, I, I, am I the only person talking about behavioral experimental design and stuff like that, and then in like the other methods classes, experimental design comes up, <laughs> but in terms of like blocks, adventure data, then that kind of thing, so not like the,
or you could try to create similarly that um, that you have a clear uh, graph of um, of a certain kind of pathway you're residing in in, in, in physiology, um, and then you might want to look at discrimination uh, type tasks, things that uh, that still can generate uh, like physics still can generate you know threshold performance, um, but uh, but at least you know that you have um, you have engaged the the, the substrate you're interested in. So if you're a systems neuroscientist, if you're interested in perceptual systems. Uh, uh, that is very crucial. I think when you're kind of going to the more uh, kind of decision-related uh, research, then you know it's again a, de a, a decision, um, and um, and and it's, it's again part of the model and how you think about it. I, I have two examples. One which is a little bit related to this measurement uh, consideration, and the other is another I think potential that we have in behavior that we don't take into consideration often. So, so as I said, I. Uh, in my research, I often want to look at um, um, both the behavioral time courses of attention, and I also want to link them to physiological dynamics of the stimulus processing. So, um, so one of the things that um, that I found always very, uh, very crucial in the line of work that I do, uh, which is weirdly not very common in attention research and uh, and such, is that uh, kind of whatever I do, I want to have a strong. I mean, I'm doing non-invasive physiology. I'm not recording directly from the substrate. I want to know that the, the process that uh, that is perception is occurring. So, for example, in my uh, and I already said that you know there are kind of uh, measurements that we can uh, obtain from having a subject just view a, a strong stimulus. And in vision science, often a strong stimulus is a nice, great thing with high contrast. And and what I'm showing here is just one random subject that I picked. Um, and this is their uh, their response uh, time unfolding response of uh, of power at uh, different frequencies. So this is a quantification of a visual evoked uh, narrow band uh, response to the onset of stimulus. And then you uh, you know in order to uh, to be able to measure behavioral fluctuations together with such a strong stimulus. You need to think of a way in which you know the processing of that stimulus could be biased or modulated to provide some sort of benefit in performance. Uh, and of course, just you know, th these stimuli are very super special. They don't have necessarily, uh, uh, they don't provide off the off the bat a very clear way to assess performance within its dynamic range. And so this is just a, you know an example of the actual experiment that I ran, where I used these two kind of gray things, and I had my subjects. Um, and have to detect a very, very small thing at one of those locations. So this is kind of a marriage of the need to, on the one hand, know that I'm driving stimuli the way that my friends across the hall are driving them in the monkey where they have an electrode that is showing, mind you, exactly a response like this, okay, to this type of stimulus. So, so you know, we, we, uh, that's kind of, that's as a, as a cognitive neuroscientist mm -hmm. doing non-invasive, that gives me some satisfaction to see that I have the same kind of unfolding, the same, kind of narrow-bandedness and morphology of a response there. I know that I have the response on the one hand, but I then kind of kind of find a way to still see whether I could sh look at modulations in this uh, in this response by, by embedding a very weak stimulus, and that stimulus that I could, of course, run psychophysics on, this is a contrast decrement, and, um, and I can do psychophysics on it. Okay, so that's uh, one example. Um, I don't know, I was thinking I would, um, so maybe I'll just show you kind of one end result of this study because we're already looking at um, at this um, task and because there's another level of sophistication in behavioral craftsmanship, if you will, uh, that went into this task, which is the fact that, um, so of course I can link the, 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 uh, the response I showed you, this kind of narrow band increase in power uh, to uh, unilateral stimulus in physiology, but uh, in this study I also took another approach, which is to actually look at the time course of performance uh, uh, in the absence of physiology. So uh, so there, uh, what I did is basically I built a time course of performance by looking at how well people can perceive this little fleck of decrement as a function of a big reset event. And again, reset, when I say reset, that could mean physiological things, because we could introduce resets, or there, there is a hypothesis, and maybe Leon talks about this in relation to neural oscillations and ERPs, 
But there is uh, the, the assumption that, um, that if I do something dramatic to the sensory system, then I reset perceptual processes. I'm purposely talking in vague terms. Uh, here, the reset that I'm doing uh, might indeed do that to, uh, to the physiology, but uh, we can also see that we can also reset perception also just purely behaviorally. So if I, for example, present a very brief flash of four dots around one of the locations, at that particular moment, I have reset perception, I have biased attention towards that location, and I've done another thing, which I'll show you in the data in a second. Uh, but the logic of this experiment was, even before we look at physiology, um, let's uh, take a look at uh, the full design and see how does performance on this target vary as a function of time to this reset. So I'm gonna, uh, yeah. So, 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 so this is the full design. These are the two stimuli. They're on for like four seconds. Why? Because I want to know that I'm driving the visual system properly and that if I were to do physiology here, I would have that signal. Uh, I'm doing this reset event, which is here actually conceptually, behaviorally. Like this is an attentional reset. Now I know attention has been grabbed to this location at a particular time, and this time is extremely crucial for this design. So I'm going to call that time zero. And I'm going to intersperse my targets. I will only have one target in each trial, and, um, and the target will appear uh, uh, from 0.75 seconds before the reset all the way to one second after the reset. But I said one trial, one target, or even not that because I have catch trials, but there's not more than one target in a trial. And over the course of the entire experiment, I basically have all these possible intervals with respect to this, uh, to this uh, reset event. Okay? So here I am basically doing something that is a little bit like a very kind of uh, low sampling rate of, uh, of uh, sampling uh, behavior. Right? So I'm going to build a time course based on all these spins. Is this clear? Clear? Okay. So, and I told you I'm in the business of attention, so here the target event is occurring at the same location, but of course it's also interesting to look at what happens, what is the fate of, uh, of, of processing in the other location, which is opposite, and, uh, and again, we, we can kind of uh, construe with experimental design a time course of, uh, of performance. Um, and really, just briefly, I told you that these four dots can do something else. They can also apparently mask performance entirely. So now I'm plotting exactly as we had it here. Zero is the reset. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm showing performance accuracy as a function of, um, of, uh, of time towards this, um, this reset. And at that location, apparently, if a reset occurs shortly after a target appears, then you're almost blind to it. But that's not what we were interested in looking at. We were really interested, because this is a, a well-known phenomenon called uh, object substitution masking. Uh, what we were interested is in looking at what happens after that. After I, because obviously this masking is actually the best evidence possible that I did indeed reset the system. I'm blind there. Like something really dramatic happened. Uh, um, but then as a function of time, I can see the performance obviously recovers. So this is now a time course that is construed from all those different trials. Uh, and, and you can see that there is some kind of fluctuation in behavior at that same location. Now one could ask, is this something that is very specific to that location, or is this something that is general to the entire visual field? Yeah. So the mask, so in this case, are you used to masking studies? Have you, are you familiar yeah. with the masking literature? Yeah, so I think my convention of plotting this is always confusing for people who look at masking literature. But I am basically plotting, so this particular point is a point where my target appeared, and the mask is, uh, um, and, 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 uh, and basically what it means is that, um, that I mean, it's actually in both uh, directions, but, but the, the, the impact is both before and after the mask. So if you're presenting something right before uh, the mask, it's, um, it's blind. You're blind to it because the mask occurs very shortly after it, and then you don't. Uh, so the t these are the target onset. This point is a target that appeared like one or two refresh rates before the mask appeared, and 32 milliseconds is not enough for you to uh, to hang on to whatever just happened. Okay, so 
this exact kind of sensory trace that has been completely lost to oblivion. Uh, so is this a, a, a location-specific effect? Um, is there any fluctuation in the other location, or is there an equivalent uh, fluctuation in the other location? So for that we have the opposite location, and you can see that there is a fluctuation here, and, um, and that this fluctuation um, seems to be similar in scale, but different in phase, right? So, so it seems to be kind of anti-correlated. When, when you have a good moment in one location, you have a bad moment in the other, suggesting that we might have this kind of um, alternation uh, in, in the ability to perform this kind of distributed attention um, task. I didn't say that my subjects all were instructed to distribute attention uh, uh, broadly on both locations, and they were also told that these four dots are not predictive, not in time or in location, as to when the target or where so we don't need to stay in the time domain, and here again, th this is a method that's, uh, that's, uh, that we developed uh, in 2012. Uh, we don't need to stay in the time domain, we could of course take this snippet of data and quantify it in the spectral domain, where we find kind of a 4 hertz uh, alternation rhythm uh, for both of these time courses, and already as you said, we could look at phase relationships and see that indeed behavior is fluctuating in both locations in a uh, non-uniform fashion, because this is, uh, right, so if the phases were uniform over my group of subjects, it means that they're random, but, uh, but they're not random, they're quite, uh, uh, they're not significantly, they're, non, they're significantly non-uniform, and they're centered not too far from 180 degrees, suggesting kind of almost perfect anti-phase uh, performance. So what are we doing? We're doing spectral analysis to behavioral data. This is not something that uh, has been done before. Um, and um, this is not a uh, full talk about my science. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but I will say that this method has been by now replicated in uh, five different continents, four different continents. So this is making us very happy, and, and the method has been developed and has been um, teaching us a lot of interesting things about the time course of performance. Um, so that was an example, kind of a long winded uh, way to talk about how we choose our stimuli, but also. As a tangent, I showed you another use of uh, behavioral um, behavioral measures that uh, that is quite sophisticated. Um, I'm not talking about the physiological counterparts of this, but I can say that there uh, there is a um, a fluctuation in the perceptual processes that is tracking this uh, this response. And if you're interested more in learning more about this, uh, obviously you could talk to me. Um, another uh, stimulus consideration that I feel even more strongly about. Oh, and I will say there's one thing I didn't tell you about, right? We were talking a lot about psychophysics, um, right? We were talking about psychophysics, about having a parametric uh, level uh, for stimuli intensity. And actually, I none of you said, hey, wh where is the psychophysics here in terms of the function fit, etc." cetera? And, uh, and I will get back to this. But in this particular experiment, the actual the intensity of this uh, stimulus is fixed, but customized per subject. So I skipped the, the, the part where we do psychophysics, um, and we do psychophysics because we want to be in maximal dynamic range. And in order to show this kind of modulation, uh, we need to have room both to improve and to have declines in performance. So we put our subject in a separate procedure uh, through uh, uh, psychophysics where we vary the intensity of the we vary the intensity of the stimulus, and we had everyone more or less at 50 percent. Okay, so that is important, and and of course those thresholds could be vastly different. People have different. <coughs> so you could still completely take a point to go back. Here, if you take a point, I don't know where data, somebody else is face feature. Yeah. You can now do psychophysics on, I guess, the contrast of the stimuli on the science. I could do this experiment, which already takes an hour, and multiply it by. One point. But okay, but what will happen then? What did we learn from the previous example? Okay. I'm gonna click away yeah. and go back, 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 back. No, but this is important, and this is kind of why. And like, what would happen then if I had a fixed interval? Okay, if I had a fixed interval, that I wouldn't be able to measure an endogenous rhythm of the subject. I would be imposing some temporal structure, and when we impose, for example, a regular temporal structure, we see that thresholds change. So that is kind of really kind of the part of experimental design we need to understand. Every choice we make in experimental design is, um, is crucial. 
and crucial to my um, experiment, sorry about this epileptic uh, situation, um, crucial to my design is this exhaustive sampling, is this extremely long trial, this absolutely unpredictable temporal uh, reset, and uh, and of course, also with respect to it, of course, this is not much to predict, right? You have from minus 0.7 to one second after. So there's not, there's really no structure or no temporal structure in this experiment because I am interested in internal rhythms. And what I managed to show in my research so far is that there is uh, an endogenous sampling rhythm that is uh, uh, taking place when we have to distribute attention. So that's Extremely, extremely. So, if I wanted to do your experiment, I would have to uh, hire uh, uh, some individual to like work for me for half a year, come in, do this experiment at all possible intensity levels, and I uh, want to do other things. So, I, so this is not amenable. <laughs> um, okay. So then, uh, this is um, I think a really cool um, potential that we have when we. Um, when we design our stimulus, okay? So when we're designing our stimulus, we need to ask ourselves, what type of process am I interested in? I told you a bit about that before. Before I was interested in a visual process, I wanted a, a visual process that I know how to measure, and that's why I use those strong cumuli, and I wanted a visual process that I know how to measure within which I could embed something difficult to detect, okay? Now I'm gonna show you an example um, of a line of work that we're uh, running in the lab <coughs> that asks a question about whether we have perceptual rhythms similar or akin to the ones I've shown you in auditions. And the question on whether there are perceptual cycles or sampling mechanisms in the auditory modality, if you read the literature and if you read the big names in the field, it's a question that you're not supposed to ask. The jury is completely settled, no. Audition works differently. But if you're a bit more critical and you read the literature a little harder, what you find is a group of vision scientists who went into audition and started, uh, so if, if in vision science we did these little conscious decrement or threshold stimuli in these type of studies, what they thought is, okay, I'm gonna think up of something very difficult to hear. Okay, I'm gonna do a click, and the click will have different loudnesses. Or I'll do a noise stream, and the noise stream will have a little gap and the gap will be very short, um, and uh, and will be like a, a, a parametric uh, variation, of either of the duration of the gap or of like how deep the gap is. Right? You could have noise going from you know certain intensity and then going down and back up, etc. So they took these very simple uh, pitches, thinking that those would be the most equivalent um, uh, stimulus parameters that could uh, compare to, for example, a very dim flash or a Gabor that is that has a change in orientation or a change in, in contrast. Except that in the visual cortex, detecting this kind of contrast decrement is something that occurs with visual machinery, which I think uh, we agree is, at least the ability to report these things, is something that is quite cortical. And the perceptual cycles or attentional sampling is something that we think of is quite cortical. And so when I decided that I want to go into the auditory modality, I said to myself, okay, I need to talk to an auditory expert because I want to design a stimulus that will take me to that level in audition. I want to design a stimulus that I can't resolve with one ear, which means with one cochlea. I want to design a stimulus that will allow me uh, to kind of know that I am now measuring perceptual abilities that hinge on cortical systems. Why? Because I'm interested in attention. And attention does not dramatically affect cochlear uh, uh, performance as it does cortical performance. So I'm not going to say now that it doesn't uh, affect co co cochlear at all, but, but I will say like the, the size of attention is not at these very low level machinery levels. Um, so, uh, so that's what uh, we did and we really honestly spent like a full term designing a stimulus that will allow us to measure performance in audition, which is uh, at least collicular if not cortical. Yes. I want a stimulus that probes the level, so the title here is, let's probe the right processing level. If I want to look at fluctuations in performance, am I hypothesizing something about hair cells? Probably not. I'm an extension researcher and I'm cognitive neuroscience. I'm not 
so interested in the architecture of the basilar membrane and how that is modulated by, but I don't know. What, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a dental researcher, I'm interested in cortex. So if I want to probe cortex in a, now a completely different system, I need to think about the architecture of the modality and, and then design a stimulus that to my, to the knowledge that we have, will probe the system at the correct level. Right? So that would be at a level that, is, that cannot be resolved with one ear, but rather requires integration between both ears. And that is thought to be, this, this type of integration is thought to be at a higher cortical or follicular level. Integration between the ears is, uh, is something that is used in sound localization. Uh, but it's also true that sound localization, I mean, you know, uh, the ears and the auditory system, not sure that it's like designed to be a localization system. It can localize. The localization is very poor, right? And it's true that it uses these integration mechanisms for localization. Yeah. Really good. What, are the what are the stimuli? Yes, of course. Yeah, I What's the function that they so, so no, the point is here a little bit different. I'm taking my behavioral measures and I'm designing a stimulus that will allow me to talk about modulation in the system. That's what people who do attention are interested in. They want to see where can they see modulation. I'm interested in the time domain. So I'm interested in seeing fluctuations that could govern how, uh, how we actually process sensory input as well as how we, for example, integrate different sensory in inputs in different systems. So, so that's my kind of I'm interested in that, and that's why I would like to go to something that requires integration over the ears, because if I can solve something with one ear, I'm not going to hypothesize that any of these cognitive functions take effect there. Okay. And so this is, a, a, so as I say, the, the previous ex experiments use uh, simple auditory targets that are probably resolved peripherally, and therefore, if I think of a, a cortical dynamic, I'm using the wrong stimulus, if I use a click or a gap. And so this is the stimulus we came up with, um, and this is work that uh, uh, Yaniv Abir in my lab spent the term basically designing uh, the stimulus uh, with some consultation from Eli Nelkin, your very own Eli Nelkin. Uh, and what we came up with is a stimulus that is basically a random noise. We had a few versions, but this is a random noise a stimulus that has both ears basically getting the same exact input until a critical short period of time occurs in which we have a decorrelation of the two inputs. Okay, so this is just and I'm really trying to make a very uh, very specific point. We could talk a lot about the research, but this is just a specific point, because if I am going to try to uh, to uh, discuss fluctuations in auditory perception, which is central function, I have to take uh, uh, a stimulus that will actually require this central processing in order to resolve. So we use uh, this decorrelation, this short decorrelation, you have a zoom in on the decorrelation uh, here to see kind of how they, they basically diverge, and they do that for a very short period of time. No. Is decorrelation regular, or is it just the... The decorrelation... Uh, I mean, is there like that? I think you're asking maybe about this, right? So then, kind of, this is what we want from our students. We want to do psychophysics, and we want to find each person's uh, kind of decorrelation threshold or detection threshold, and, and this, these would be just example data from one, uh, from one subject showing that you know, we could go from, uh, from a very high correlation level, basically, uh, to a very low correlation level, which is a high decorrelation level, and we have a nice kind of function that takes us from zero to 100 with a, with a fit that we can fun uh, fit, uh, with a function that could fit and therefore delineate um, the different uh, thresholds. Yeah. There's going to be, there's going to be, th so that's why I say, at least collicular or up. Okay. And for me that's good enough because those are regions that bold studies as well as uh, some physiology studies show, those are areas that are modulated by attention when you fast or orient attention. So, so, I mean, you know, is my, um, yeah, I mean, is my phenomenon, so even, like, if you look at bold research and you find the collicular modulation, you're like, Maybe when it's incoming, maybe it's feedback, right? So those would be kind of concerns. Um, but but it doesn't really matter for me because if there's a fluctuation, a cortical fluctuation, and this is now a little bit of a more general comment, like my interest in these fluctuations in this temporal structure, in behavior, and in neural signal, 
have to do with their potential to actually integrate different systems. So our field as a whole has been very modality specific, and I think that modality specific research in cognitive neuroscience has led us to prioritize the spatial domain. We look at the patch of cortex to try to see how it is spatially organized with respect to our stimuli, with respect to our factors, and, and this has taught us a lot about the specific modality, but when we are agents in the world, we perceive using many different senses, and part of my little agenda is to actually work in these different systems, investigate the temporal codes that might be governing how information is being processed, because I actually believe that, that when we are trying to start describing how the system interacts, the temporal aspects uh, are a very interesting and uh, productive medium to do so. So, yeah, so, so follicular cortical that's already in the realm where we could start thinking about the integration between Okay, so, uh, yeah, so this is an energy study. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we could use psychophysics as a calibration tool and what I have 20 minutes still, shall I? Is that okay? So I think this is uh, probably uh, what we will manage to do today. Um, so uh, you actually saw already examples of that, but I would like to just emphasize why do we need to calibrate our stimuli, right? So um, we'll just jump over this funny example and uh, and talk about the fact that, you know, in a given experiment, we might be using stimuli of different types. So here I'm giving you, like, an example of a stimulus that we use in the lab also. These are moving dots. I'll show you an example in a second. And, it's a, and over time, I might want to introduce a target that will be the change, the brief change of color of the dots. So these are, these little arrows obviously are not on the dots. They're just denoting the fact that this is a cloud of dots. It's moving coherently in one direction. And at a given moment in time, it will change saturation or color and then it will go back, okay? And this is, again, this would be my parametric uh, space. I can vary the degree of change in color or more specifically in saturation, that's easier. Um, and I might have in my experimental design reasons to use two different clouds. So I'll have, you know, the yellow cloud and the blue cloud, and the blue cloud as well changes its, its color. So the task could look something like this. So this would be, you know, the blue cloud is up, and then the yellow cloud comes on. And, um, and of course, if I want to assess performance over the course of, of time, um, I think you have another one coming your way. So th these are the type of stimuli, and I, and I don't think there are targets in this particular stimulus, but the, 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 the target would be kind of a very brief desaturation of part of one cloud's color, okay? So part of the yellow cloud suddenly would become a little whiter, or part of the blue cloud would become a little bit brighter. Uh, then you could, so, so one way to, um, uh, so psychophysics could help us basically. So now this is again, just random subject performance that I pulled out. Uh, and you can see that indeed, we have very different detection thresholds for yellow and, and blue. And, <coughs> um, and so this is horrible, right? If I just took any like particular level intensity of a, of a, uh, of a, of a uh, target, then uh, you know, I'd be in really bad shape, right? My uh, subject would be almost at the ceiling for the blue and would be barely, you know, 25% for the yellow. So if I do proper psychophysics, I can um, circumvent this. Um, ah, one thing I didn't say before is that uh, the, the method that uh, I'm showing you and advocating uh, thus far is the method of constant stimulus. A uh, method of constant stimulus is a method in which you really do kind of use uh, different uh, stimulus intensities and you repeat each stimulus intensity in a way that is determined by the experiment. So you are using the stimulus intensity as a, an independent variable and you're repeating it as you see right. So you might, as I say, densely sample where you think your dynamic range is and more sparsely, uh, sparsely sample at the, at the edges. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of uh, jump over um, some examples that I prepared for you. Um, um, I mean, I do have another example, but the, it is basically equivalent. So sometimes we might look at, an, at, at uh, as I told you, I'm interested in how the systems are actually interacting. So for example, audio and visual stimuli. And then again, you know, if I, I you, you've already saw, saw my visual stimulus, you've seen my uh, auditory stimulus. And so you could look at, for example, a given subject and, and see that, you know, obviously, right, these, these, uh, these axes are completely non-equivalent, right? In one case, we're talking about contrast. In one case, we're talking about um, about decorrelation between the ears. There's really uh, there's really no way to equate them in any theoretically driven manner. 
And so psychophysics could really help us um, kind of make sure that we're, when we're combining a visual and a, an auditory stimulus together, we are probing performance at the, at the same level for a given subject, even though they are much more sensitive comparatively to a visual stimulus than an auditory stimulus. Um, and I already mentioned the fact that, uh, um, so I'm not going to dwell too much uh, over this, but I've already mentioned the fact that every subject that comes into the lab has a different psychophysical uh, threshold, and so it's nicer for my, da my data if I, uh, if I have, uh, have everybody where I want them. So method of constant stimulus is costly, right? It takes a lot of time. You need to kind of take a whole range, and subjects are different, and stimuli are different, so you might end up taking a range that is broader than you need, and you're repeating every intensity for 10 or 20 or 30 times. Uh, you are using intensity levels as an independent variable, so you are in control of kind of how noisy or the granularity of your data on the one hand, but on the other hand, it, this is actually um, quite, it's quite a costly, it's quite a costly procedure, it takes time. Um, there are other ways to, um, to assess uh, thresholds. Um, so method constantly is what I have uh, with years adopted. Um, there are other methods uh, that basically um, have subjects um, control uh, a stimulus and basically reach its own threshold, so they could kind of dial in and dial out. Um, and there's another method that is related to it, which is method of, 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 of limits, which basically takes a stimulus and kind of uh, reduces its intensity, and then the subject says, okay, it's appeared, or it increases the sensitivity, and then the subject says, it's appeared, and that is called method of limits. Um, I honestly don't read a lot of papers that use these methods these today, but I might be, this might be an oversight, because there might be... Adjustment wouldn't be recovered, no? Uh, they, they, they do cover it. What I did in... The method of adjustment, how they find the, the, the colors. The, the For like... Um, yeah, well, for screens you do kind of great, and you do gamma fitting, which is also should be probably a little chapter here for anyone doing vision uh, science. Uh, but it's true that in chromaticity, uh, it's a little bit, so chromaticity is very complicated, and sometimes having a perceiver is very valuable. So actually doing the right experiment is challenging, uh, and, and it's true that, that there are a lot of like examples of color mixing and color uh, projection that um, to equate you make a contour disappear, for example, um, in, in an adjustable manner. Sometimes this is the only uh, the only way you have. I might show uh, an example later. But I think one method that has um, gained a lot of popularity due to its e efficiency is adaptive procedures. So now uh, these are experiments where you are presenting stimuli. Uh, or you are presenting a starting point of stimuli, and basically you're doing or running some kind of uh, model uh, that is trying to project what is the stimulus intensity that we need in order to reach a good assessment of the threshold. So uh, there, are, there are a few different uh, ways to go. A um, simple way um, is actually a staircase procedure. So in a staircase procedure, you might start uh, um, your stimulus intensity at some point, say up here, and uh, I'm showing a stimulus, let's say this is contrast, a strong stimulus, your subject uh, is able, you're, you're able to, um, to, to detect it, so I, I present a next stimulus based on subject success or failure, uh, and I'm going to then present a weaker stimulus, and I'm going to go on and on until I reach a point where my subject just fails, okay? So now they fail, so I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to now reduce the gradient out here, I'm gonna I'm gonna go up one. I'm gonna I'm gonna make the stimulus a little bit easier. Did they succeed? No, still not. Okay, let's go back up, make it again easier, uh, and so on and so forth until you complete a certain uh, length of trial, a certain length of experiment, or a certain criteria that is related to reversal. So these kind of inflection points are called reversals, basically, whenever you uh, you kind of change the direction of your stimulus. Um, and these, you, you will hear things like uh, th uh, one up, uh, three down, or three up, uh, three down, one up, and that <coughs> refers to kind of what is the algorithm with which you uh, you improve, uh, sorry, uh, you decrease or increase the intensity of the stimulus. So, um, so it's uh, yeah, 
that, that so, so one criterion, for example, to terminate such experiment would be when you have a traversal. Okay. So. Um, So there are a lot of problems. Tension, with this. Yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of problems with this, and of course, I'm not going to say that constant stimulus doesn't have those problems. But with constant stimulus, at least you have enough data to, to weigh out the noise. But the biggest issue with adaptive procedures is that your performance as a subject dictates how the experiment runs. So it means a, all your subjects will have different set of stimuli they're performing on, and b, any kind of weird thing that happened at a given moment in the in, a, in this experiment could. Uh, kind of change the course of the entire um, of the entire um, experiment or the entire assessment of threshold. So these, yeah, this is the reversal point that I uh, explained. I think I have an example of uh, how this kind of, of, of things we know go wrong with this in a second. Um, but obviously there is a big, the, the big uh, kind of um, attraction here is, uh, you know, why, why should I show so many trials if, you know, my subject's performance can reduce that state? Um, and then, um, and then the other, um, I mean, and, and so I already said performance could be erratic and it would kind of change the course of this. Another, uh, um, kind of related, uh, downside of this method is that you don't have a psychometric curve. So all the wonderful things I told you about, you know, in terms of having this interpolated function that describes performance and in terms of having the richness of data per subject are uh, weakly, if at all, uh, related here. Okay, so this is a map. You get your threshold as, as you know, as good as it is, and basically you're you're left with one, with one number at the end. So, um, so I guess in the interest of time, we're not going to discuss a lot of the caveats. But I just thought I'd show you kind of a, a very kind of simple example of how these things could go wrong. Uh, basically, you know, this is uh, um, Yaniv who performed the loudness staircase. We, we kind of thought, oh, well, we need to decide before we even start the experiment how, uh, you know, uh, what what loudness should we use for for our subjects, and uh, and we were just playing around and doing these physics, and we, you know, this is the the classic kind of if we start very uh, very loud, then then we reach one threshold. If we start very faint, we we reach another loudness, which it would be the performance. Uh, so this is kind of an extreme thing. You could even say this is kind of a limit method, if you will. Uh, the threshold probably, or the right intensity is probably somewhere in the middle there. But the point is, wherever you start, and this is the, the key thing. So I already discussed the fact that the subject is determining the intensity of your stimuli. You lost your independent variable. You do still have one independent variable, which is where do you start? Turns out that's two methods. So how much, I mean, and that is kind of a, eh, not a great thing. And for example, I ran, um, these type of staircases on patients with neglect, and there, you know, where where you start is quite a big deal. Because, for example, for our patients' population, the we were staircasing how long the stimulus had to be on for them to be able to perform on it. And and of course, we took it for granted that that they will need more time. Because, well, for one, they're patients, and patients just need more time. They're older, and all those other things. But then, at the end of the day, you know, if we know that the starting point can change performance so dramatically, then we didn't really um, we didn't really save much because ultimately we would probably need to start at the same. I mean, it's not clear what would be the right intensity then to start with your control group. So, so it's hairy, but it's efficient. Uh, this is another relevant uh, word here: hysteresis. I mean, this is actually a known um, kind of phenomenon in perception, which is that when you have uh, uh, intensity that is descending. So, if you start high and you go low, then uh, then the threshold um, is is lower than if you start invisible and go high. Okay, so this is a known a known effect that has to do possibly with things that are related to expectation and being able to predict how something sounds. Right, so when you're starting low, you don't even know what it is you're looking for, and your criterion might be a little bit more uh, conservative. While if you already heard something, you're expecting it, you know how it's uh, how it's uh, how it is. Uh, how it feels, then you're willing to work with a noisier representation in order to um, to, uh, to describe it. Um, okay, so questions. I mean, I, I do have another section that discusses kind of
kind of how models uh, can be fit in physiological data, but I don't know that four minutes will take us m very long. I mean, will take us very far. So, um, so I guess what we could do with these four minutes is um, I don't know. Let's see. I've prepared uh, quite a number of other things. Um, maybe, maybe for these final minutes, um, I could um, kind of talk a little bit about the practical aspect of what it is that we do, and then people remind me of uh, a few other aspects that I didn't talk about with respect to the function. Um, so, um, so we'll stare a little bit more at, uh, at functions. Uh, I don't know, like I know some of you are taking the exercise, will they be doing function fits in their something? Okay, so, uh, so we provided you with some, uh, with some data and, uh, and some scripts uh, to play around with it and get a feel for it. Um, uh, but kind of the components of the of the function fitting uh, procedure, uh, kind of this is the general procedure. Obviously, when you're doing kind of thinking about your function, it already starts when you're uh, thinking about the stimulus levels, uh, in including the trial count, the range of stimulus uh, levels, and um, and and um, and so on and so forth. I just wanted to kind of take a look at this and discuss kind of different parameters that we uh, that we talk about when we're looking at psychometric function. So, um, so we already talked about the threshold, which is kind of where it is, uh, so we could come up with whatever um, relevant threshold is, rel is right. So if you're looking at, uh, at the two AFC, so this is two alternative fourth choice case, uh, 75 is obviously used as threshold, does someone know? It's kind of probably all over the screen. So chance in a two AFC is 50%. Right, so if someone is blind and just doing this, they're at 50 percent. So, um, so 70 percent, 75 percent is kind of dictated by how many alternatives you have in your task, and and that would be regarded the, the threshold, and that is uh, the first parameter that we assess. The second parameter I is describing the slope in general, um, and we discuss the slope a little bit. Uh, and then there are two other parameters. Uh, one is the guess rate, and the guess rate is basically this crossing point. So it's obviously the guess rate. And uh, the actual level of relevant threshold are obviously tightly related, and the guess rate is as follows: is like what would happen if you were just to guess or just to guess the same option time and again. Um, and then, um, um, and then uh, the lapse rate is the fourth parameter that you fit in these kind of uh, functions. But the lapse really is um, is related to this part. So, can, can, can you make it to perfect performance? And you are typically going to be not at perfect performance, but when you're not at perfect performance, the assumption is that has little to do with the intensity of the stimulus. So if you're not at 100%, so a good study should have this part of the intensity level be easy. You're supposed to theoretically, an ideal observer would be at 100%, but you're not an ideal observer, you sneeze, and you do all sorts of things uh, that preclude you, preclude you from being at 100%, but, um, uh, but, the, but these failures are not related to the stimulus intensity. So that is kind of the difference uh, that is important between the guess rate and the last rate um, in, uh, in, um, in kind of the parameter choices. And I guess these are the description of the parameter choices and other measures that you will, uh, you will get a chance to interact with if you use our code. Um, finally, uh, this is a book that I find is particularly useful um, uh, there is a second edition by now, so probably better getting the, the second edition. And this is a psychophysics book. It gives you kind of more than you want to know about the background, a lot of practical stuff that you do want to know, and, uh, and also pieces of code implementing it. So I think that's kind of nice. Uh, and I've also heard that this book is quite good. So this is again from a group uh, from uh, Lou and Docher that are uh, serious vision, uh, vision scientists. Uh, and I believe this, uh, this book also comes with a toolbox. So I hope you found this useful. Um, and um, if you find yourself in uh, in your research, uh, regardless of whether you're measuring spikes, calcium channels, or uh, awake behaving uh, humanoids, uh, uh, if psychophysics can help you or you're not sure, then you can feel free. There's quite a lot of expertise in my group by now on the different me methods and the different modalities of tasks.
dealing with these, uh, he's missing an EAG button. Is that the plan? But he's also brain age, so we, 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 we let you know. Yeah. Yeah. The last EG, EG and the ECOG. 